So I request the moderator and the chairpersons for this session, the Parveen Bhatia, so you can come up ahead. Also invite the other chairpersons, Dr. Raman Goyal, Dr. Arun Prasad, Dr. Matthias Phobi, and Ms. Richard Jaiswal to join us at the front of the auditorium. Good morning, all of you. May I request Dr. Phobi? All of us know Dr. Phobi for so long. And uh, he he is considered the father figure of bariatric surgery. First, he was practicing in U.S. and now he is practicing in Mohawk in Indore. And he has made a paradigm shift in the image of the bariatric surgery in India. Also, I, we are very very thankful to Dr. Phobi for spending the quality time of your life in India and in Indore and making such a difference. Now may I request Dr. Phobi, he is going to tell us about how to choose the best bariatric surgery procedure for your patient established versus the novel. Dr. Phobi, please. Thank you, Dr. Bashir, for the nice, kind introduction. Uh, I've been very impressed with the way the meeting has run so far. Everybody has been on time. And the speakers have been very uh, coincide, so I'm going to try to do the same. Uh, I'm going to talk to you how to choose the best bariatric metabolic procedure for your patient. You, they gave me a rather difficult topic. This is an area that is new, and uh, so I'm going to try to approach it. But I'll start by bringing you greetings from uh, Sames Geo University, where I am with Dr. Banderi at the Mohawk uh, Bariatric and Robotic Surgery Center, where I've been working with him for the last two years. And uh, I would like to disclose also that being a surgeon and being, having been in bariatric surgery for 43 years, seven years ago, because of type 2 diabetes, I elected to have the surgery done on me. And my diabetes has been controlled for seven years because gastric bypass is an effective method of controlling type 2 diabetes. On the other part of it, I have a company that produces a device, and so I have to disclose that to you. At Mohawk, where I work with Dr. Banderi, we have done about 10,000 cases in the last seven years. Uh, last year, we did 13,700 cases, and this year, we are approaching about 15 uh, to 16, uh, 1,600 cases. We, the, the shift has changed. We're doing more one-third sleeve, one-third gastric bypass, and one-third mini gastric bypass and we're also doing uh, the banded versions, modifications of this procedure. I will start by telling you that those who cannot learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. There were some lectures this morning, but I will not go into it about the hydra hernia repair, but I'll leave that alone, and if there are questions later on, I'll put my feedback. I'm talking to you about treatment of obesity. Obesity is a multifactorial disease with multiple medical complications. The treatment options are many, including surgeon, surgery. Unfortunately, all of them are not effective. The only effective modality available at this time with long-term follow-up with more than a year is surgery. But surgery cannot be done alone. It has to be done in a multidisciplinary setup using this backup of all the other uh, modalities. So a multidisciplinary approach has to be used for uh, managing obesity. We are blessed as surgeons to have various surgical procedures that we can use. As of last week, the armamentarium were like 27 procedures, but we just had one come out called gastric plication, which is going uh, through some work right now where they're just going to put a band and create a sleeve and that gives us one more modality. So I know some people say, but you have so many different treatments. Well, think about our internists. One minute, how many treatments do they have for diabetes? A lot of treatments, so they have a choice. So in surgery, we like, we enjoy the, the fact that who drinks a lot. You have to watch out what procedure you're given because they are more likely to have liver failure. So you don't give them an operation that will predispose them to protein coloring, malnutrition, and liver failure. So these are the demographic factors. So you know the determining factors. You know the disease, and these are the determining factors. Now, these are the mechanisms. At first, we used to say 
restriction and malabsorption. We now know 10 different contributory mechanisms that are effective. Starting with restriction, neural stimulation, patient compliance, the malabsorptive effect, the dumping neurotensin effect, the ghrelin effect that causes anorexia, foregut effect with the release of GIP and PYY, hindgut effect, GLP release, microbiota, the bacteria in the GI tract is changed by the procedure we do, and that affects the weight loss and the response to metabolic syndrome, and bile salts, and there are many more. This is what we currently know, and as we study, I'm sure we're going to find out more mechanisms. As we understand the mechanisms, we create more procedures to address these mechanisms. At first, we were very limited, we say, restriction and malabsorption. So that is beautiful that we know the different mechanisms. Then, we've been using these procedures, as I said. First, we know the disease. Now, we know the procedures and the mechanism. Finally, we know the outcomes of the various procedures. We know that some procedures are good for one year, two years, by the third year, they fail. We know that some procedures are reflusogenic. After you have those procedures, your GERD will be washed. You lose weight, but you end up with GERD. We know that there are some procedures that will cause you to have nutrient deficiency. When you bypass the gastroduodenal axis, where iron and calcium is absorbed, you're going to have iron deficiency anemia. So you would avoid those procedures. There are some procedures that cause malabsorption. So you avoid those procedures when you're thinking about creating protein coloring malnutrition. There are some procedures which will make you lose weight, but because of the restriction of putting a band there, patients have food intolerance. So if you have patients who don't have teeth or they are a certain age, you don't give. So we, knowing the procedures, the outcome and their complications, now you can tell all the patients, you can do what we call do an algorithm. I am not going to discuss all 28 procedures because we don't have the time for that. There are three common procedures that are currently done worldwide. The sleeve is the most common procedure, the gastric bypass, and the one anastomosis gastric bypass called the MGB. And then there are modifications with putting a ban on them. So we would concentrate on these three in terms of the choice of a procedure. But just to put it in perspective, this is the latest statistics from the United States for the last year operations in the U.S. As you can see, see, 59% of the patients are having a sleeve. So that's a very common operation. But that is not as good as India. In India, I think it's 81% that have a sleeve. So there's a variation as to what happens, why the doctors do it. The sleeve is done because it is a relatively simple operation. Most general surgeons can see one and do one, unfortunately. There's no disruption of the gastrointestinal tract. No anastomosis, rarely problems with malabsorption, low incidence of dumping, risk of developing an internal hernia is zero, good weight loss and resolution of comorbidities by some standards compared to non-surgical treatment. So for that reason, the sleep is common and everybody tries to do it. However, the weight loss is not as good as gastric bypass, okay? The sleeve does dilate, and we're going to see about 40 to 50% of the patients coming back for revision surgery in about five years. And then the comorbidities will recur. And then the sleeve has a tendency for patients to develop reflux. And then the sleeve has problems with intractable leaks. For doctors trying to make the sleeve more effective, the narrower they make it, they create more problems with more reflux, more torsion, because of the increased uh, tension, and then they develop these intractable leaks. With, we're doing more gastrectomies now because patients have leaks that cannot be treated, so that is not good. That's why the leaks. And then we have a new syndrome that is becoming very common. We're seeing a lot of portomesenteric thrombosis in patients with leaks. In Chile, it is up to 1%, and this patient lose quite a bit of their bowel. So, even though the sleeve is the easiest procedure, it has certain disadvantages, and when you see a patient, you have to avoid that. However, we found out how to avoid that, some of these disadvantages by modifying the sleeve, by banding it to achieve the same amount of restriction without making the sleeve so narrow. With that, we have found out that we can have the same effect, and we increase it. This is our own work at the Mohawk Clinic in Indoor. This is the banded sleeve, and this is the non-banded sleeve. 
In the beginning, they both look the same. Most people say they're the same. But when you get to the sixth year, there's almost a 30% difference in the percentage excess weight loss between the banded sleeve and the non banded sleeve. That is why if you want to do a sleeve, we say put a ring on it. And there are other studies that shows that we looked at a six-year full of the banded sleeve and the non banded sleeve. At six years, 46% of the patients have lost less than 50% of the excess weight as opposed to zero of the patients who had the bandage sleeve. This data has been collaborated by Dr. Lemon's work in Belgium, but again, anytime you put a ring, you put a foreign body, you can erode, so it's about a 1% incidence of band erosion. It, what is bad about it? Simple. You can take it out endoscopically as an outpatient procedure with no consequence. Now, the gastric bypass, the gold standard, is now about the second most common procedure. However, the, you can see the gut, it's been shown in, in the Swedish studies, it lasts. But however, with long term, we find that 25 to 40% of these patients might not lose adequate weight or may they not respond. So we also have modified that to what is called the banded gastric bypass, and with that, we've increased the effectiveness. We have done work, this is a review of the literature, I didn't want to quote everything, but we've compared it in the literature. If you look at the banded gastric bypass versus the standard gastric bypass, in the beginning, they look the same. But when you get to the fourth and tenth year, this starts getting down to 55, and this stays at 70. Resolution of type 2 diabetes is better. There's food intolerance because of the ring, and there's about a 0 to 2% of uh, erosion. And please give me a one minute note so I don't go too long. I get so excited when I talk about obesity, I can talk for an hour. Okay, the MGB is the new child on the block. It's a very simple gastric bypass. I never did one till I came to India. It takes me twice as long to do a regular gastric bypass as to do a mini gastric bypass. It's an easy operation to do in the super obese. And the exit plan is very simple. So it's a very popular procedure. Easy operation, better food tolerance. The patients can eat, and they don't have to be as restrictive as with the gastric bypass. They have slightly better weight loss, better uh, resolution of type 2 diabetes and hyperlipidemia, less incidence of internal hernia, more option for revision. When a patient has complication with the MGP or one anastomosis gastric bypass, it's very easy. You just go down there and transect that gastrogegidostomy. You can make it into a gastric bypass. You can do so many things with it. So it makes it easy. So for that reason, this is becoming very popular. The disadvantages are there is a problem with bioreflux gastritis and bioreflux esophagitis. There's a lot of argument about it. But what the doctors who've done a lot of this have not done, they have not documented it. So at, in Indo right now, we are doing routine yearly endoscopies to be able to come up with the exact data of this incidence. People who have done the surgery before now have not documented that, and so it's up in the air. And we hope other doctors who do bariatric surgery will join us in our effort to document it, because it might not really be a problem, or it can be a problem. The second thing, the incidence of my marginal ulcers. One of the doctors at the last OC meeting reported about 20% incidence of marginal ulcers. People said, ah, but who else has studied it? We have to study it and find out. Nutrient deficiencies. Well, you bypass the duodenal axis, so you're going to have iron and calcium deficiency like any other gastric bypass. And 20% incidence of low protein level. In our own study in indoor, looking at the 7,000 cases we did, we took the 2,300 cases who had MGB, and we'll have a 20% incidence of albumin levels below 2.7. Normal albumin levels should be 3.5. Most doctors who do this process say, no, 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 because they have not looked at it. We have looked at it. So what did we do? We've changed our biliopancreatic lymph then from 250 centimeters to a standard 180 centimeters. So if you do not look and you don't study, you don't know. If you look and study, then you know, then you modify it. So it's a very good procedure, but you cannot do what the doctors who do the MGB do, 200, 250, 300 centimeters. So we now use a fixed length below pancreatic limb. And if we need to make it more effective, we band it rather than increase the malnutrition. Because the band will cause food intolerance, but it's not going to cause protein malnutrition. It's not going to cause liver failure. These are just some review articles to tell you about the MGB is doing a very good operation, and it's been well publicized. 30,000, 40,000 cases have been done. If you look, like I was just trying to tell you, with the three different gastric bypass, the regular gastric bypass, the banded MGB, 
You can see they all have low hemoglobin because they bypass the duodenal axis, and therefore the hemoglobin level is low. So the three procedures are equal in that. But when you get to the protein level, you notice that compared to the banded gastric bypass and the regular bypass, the MDB has low albumin levels. We documented this, and other peoples have co collaborated that study. The albumin level is related to the calcium level, so you expect to find the calcium level also low. Now, if you look at the three bypasses, this is very important. And uh, Dr. John and Dr. Batier, they can have a copy of my presentation. Or if you want us to write a paper later, they can have it. So you, it's free for you if you want to ask for it. Now, if you look at the three bypasses, we've gone and compared them. Look at papers that have published six to 10 year data. You can see that the banded gas O and the MGB are about similar, even for four to 10 years similar, but the regular gastric bypass starts failing. Resolution of type two diabetes, these two are about the same, this is less. Food intolerance, the banded gastric bypass makes it difficult for non-veg people to work because they have to chew that meat well to swallow it. But they can learn, they can learn to eat slow and chew, okay? But if you decide not to, eat slow and chew, and you have the MG, but then you're going to have yeah. that protein calorie and nutrition. So these are the disadvantages. That's what I mean. If you know the procedure, know the disadvantages and the side effects, then you know what operation to offer to what patient. We now have enough information currently to enhance our outcome and minimize the risk by matching the operation to the patient. This is the basis for an algorithm. We at Mohawk have an algorithm that will follow choosing the best operation for the patient. And that was the topic of my talk. So all I did there was to lay the foundation, how do I choose the procedure? I show you the sleeve. So if a patient walks in here with these characteristics, they would probably have a sleeve. And if we're gonna do a sleeve, we'll preferably do a bandage sleeve because of the long-term effects. So the patient of all ages will offer them a sleeve. If they don't have diabetes, they get a sleeve because sleeve is treats about 50% will respond, the other don't. So we don't like to use that. Young patients, yes, patients with no GERD, because we don't want to give patients with a GERD sleeve. Uh, we, some of the doctors who do sleeves were here to hear the talk this morning. I didn't hear any of the people who were talking about treating uh, reflux, doing a chloroplasty. <laughs> Whereas bariatric surgeons think when they do a chloroplasty, they're treating reflux. The speakers this morning talk about using nissen for the application and everything else. So I wish they could hear that, but just a chloroplasty does not treat the reflux. But these are indications for the sleeve. The gastric bypass will operate to all ages. Patients with type two diabetes, not too severe, and not on insulin. Once they get on insulin, we start thinking about the MGB. Patients with GERD, a good treatment for your obese patient is a gastric bypass is better than the nissen for the application. With the Nissen, as you heard, they have dysphagia, they have bulging problems and flatus. The gastric bypass diverts the GI tract. The patients have resolution 80 to 90% resolution of the reflux symptoms, and so that's a good process. If you're doing patients with BMI of greater than all BMIs, banded gastric bypass, BMI less than 50, you can do this. If you do patients with BMI less than 50 with a regular gastric bypass, you're gonna have a higher rate of non-responders. This is very good for respondents, for vegetarians, the regular gastric bypass. I've looked at the work that has been done here from Dr. Murphy, from the Max Clinic, who've done a lot of gastric bypass. We don't see any protein malnutrition in vegetarians who have a gastric bypass. So the gastric bypass is a very good operation for that indication. The MGB, as I said before, very good for patients who have long-term diabetes on insulin, low peptide level, all ages, high BMI, and it's a simpler operation. I'm not gonna compare myself to Dr. Banderi. He does the damn operation in 29 minutes. It takes me 62 minutes. But that is 62 minutes I use for the MGB and 90 I use for the gastric bypass. So it's an easier procedure. And some of you younger laparoscopic surgeons can do the same thing because it's an easy procedure to perform for in high risk patients. But we think they have GERD and bioreflux. We don't have the exact data, but there are a lot of cases being reversed, so we need to study that. We're seeing patients coming back with liver disease, liver failure, with ascites for protein and nutrition. So you have to choose the patients. You must be able to follow these patients.
If you are not going to see that patient and follow the patient, don't give them a procedure that 20% of them might have a protein deficiency and you never see them. They'll end up in some hospital and they'll think they're dying from alcohol disease and they die in liver failure. So you must be able to follow the patient. And number two, the patient must be able to take the supplements, the vitamins and iron you recommend. You cannot give this surgery because it works to a poor Indian person who cannot buy the vitamins. Then you turn around and blame the patient. Well, you had protein malnutrition because you didn't take the supplements. Well, the supplements cost 4,000 rupees, and there are many of those patients who cannot afford it. So as a doctor, you have to take that into consideration when you offer the procedure. It's excellent weight loss, but you're creating another problem you cannot resolve. Then if you have patients who have a problem coming from an area where there's cancer endemic, and you want to give them a gastric bypass, you have to do a sleeve with a duodenal stomach because you don't want to leave any part of the stomach that is not accessible for endoscopic evaluation. Then if you have patients who have, uh, as a second operation to the sleeve, we have these other operations I talked to you about, I don't go into detail, they would increase the effectiveness of the sleeve. You can see when I say the sleeve failed 50% of the time, people did not used to believe me. These are all procedures that are being developed to address the failure of the sleeve. And they do a very good job. They add the incretin effect and some of the malazoptic effect. And these are used for patients who have not responded to the sleeve, the gastric bypass, or the MGB. These again are patients, now we have what we call this, is called a bipartition. You let food go through the duodenum, and then you also do the incretin effect. This is very good for places where there's a lot of anemia and very strict vegetarian habit. So you see, you have choices. You know what procedure and why you do it. For patients, which makes up 95% of the patients who are overweight and they don't want surgery, they don't want to be cut intra-abdominally, we have measures that are not as effective, but they give you some good results. The balloon, the endobarrier, the V-block, the endoscopic plication, which we're not doing in Ando, and the aspire assist, and I just told you there are two more procedures coming on. Should you do a procedure on a patient because the patient walked in and asked you no and yes? It depends. A bariatric metabolic surgeon should be able to offer the best operation for the patient based on the patient's profile. It is important that a practice be able to refer patients they cannot treat to a tertiary center. Not every bariatric surgeon should treat any patient that comes in. If all you're able to do is a sleeve, and a patient shows up with type 2 diabetes, he's on 100 units of insulin, and he's barely being controlled, the blood sugar is 250, you are practicing malpractice to give that patient a sleeve. Send him over to Dr. Bartier's clinic where he does gastric bypass, and that patient has an 80% chance of getting resolution of the bypass. So that is the good practice. You guys do that. When a patient comes in and has a small breast tumor, you can excise it. But if you come and see something else more than that, you send it to the oncology center because those guys have a better service and they can take care of the patients. So uh, case one, algorithm, how does it work? 57-year-old, BMI of 57, type 2 diabetes, with GERD, strict vegetarian. Algorithm, give him a gastric bypass. Why? Or preferably a banded gastric bypass. The patient has GERD. You don't want to give him an MGB with a GERD. The patient is a very strict vegetarian. You don't want to do that, they will have protein malnutrition. Not a sleeve because type 2 diabetes is not resolved by a sleeve. GERD and high BMI, sleeve does not treat high BMI patients very well. If you do a sleeve, then you're doing it as a two-stage procedure. That's why the algorithm works. You see, when you have this, if you come to the Mohawk Clinic and you put a patient there, even the orderly in the room can tell you what that patient will have because you have a system now an algorithm that everybody can follow. You don't want to do a one anastomosis gastric bypass again. The patient has GERD and may develop protein caloric malnutrition. So choosing the best operation for the patient. Case number two, 28-year-old female, BMR 42, polycystic ovary disease, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, osteoastitis, migraine headaches. What do you give her? You give her a sleeve. Preferably a ring band a sleeve because it works better than a sleeve. Why? Not a gastric bypass. Patient has dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Gastric bypass causes anemia. You bypass the duodenal axis. So, yes, gastric bypass make the patient lose weight. But if there's a procedure that can make the patient lose the same weight without increasing the morbidity, that's fine. 
And when you have gastric bypass, you have smell deflators and other things. The sleeve will not do that. So those are the things you choose. You don't use an MGB because of the anemia, the foul smelling flatus, the body odor, and the possibility of protein deficiency. I just give you two examples, and the third one, and I'll stop. I think I've gone beyond my time. Case three, 37 year old male, BMI of 68, osteoarthritis, non vegetarian, works at your hospital as an assistant to one of the pulmonologists, is sent it to you for care. That is a good patient with an MGB. High BMI, non vegetarian, food to tolerance. Patient very, very likely to come back for follow up. They're just across the street. So you can see that patient. The patient is working and I can afford the supplements. Why won't you do a sleeve for that patient? Poor weight loss will sleeve in the super obese. He is a super obese. Why not a banded sleeve? The patient will have a good weight loss but has poor food tolerance because the patient is a non vegetarian. He cannot eat the fish and the meat. Why not the gastric bypass? The weight loss in the super obese in the gastric bypass is not good. They have a 40% failure rate and they don't respond. And the gastric bypass is technically a more difficult operation than the MGB. You see, the sense, just simple common sense. If you take these things, you can make a choice. Not a banded gastric bypass. Yes, you get a good weight loss with banded gastric bypass. But it's a more difficult operation to perform than the MGB. And the patient will have difficulties with certain food. So why don't you give the patient an operation that is easy for you to perform? The patient can tolerate the food and have the same effects as with the banded gastric bypass. So you choose the best bariatric procedure for the patient. And the only way you can do that is being able to perform this operation rather than just be a one operation physician. Finally, this is what we do at Mohawk. This is my little prep talk. Our procedures are standardized. If you're gonna do bariatric surgery, your procedure should be standardized. You cannot do study if one patient has 10 centimeter limb, the other one has 20. If you look here, the sleeve, we try to make it at this size, the polaris two to five centimeters, and then with the bandage sleeve, you will know put the ring, the size of the ring, the bandage, everything is specified. So if you walk to our room, the technicians know exactly what is gonna happen, and then we use the algorithm that we talked to you about, and I don't need to go over that, but the part I'll just emphasize here, we do do revision operations. We also have a standard as to how we revise the operations. So if a patient can't see with a failed sleeve, we give him a banded rule wire with a 100 centimeter limb and a 180 centimeter BP limb. And this follows here. And uh, we do offer other operations at Mohawk. We do sleeve gastroplasty, balloon insertion. And because some patients come wanting those procedures, the main thing, we give them an informed consent. We tell them what is going to happen with the procedure they want. And if that's what they want, they'll have it. We do do single incision laparoscopic, robotic, and endoscopic procedures. If the patient requests it and a discretion of the doctor, you can come in at BMR 50 and you want a single incision. We're not going to do it. <laughs> so even though the patient wants it, the is all the way down here. That's not a patient for a single incision, so we don't do it. So it has to be a judgment factor for the safety. The best operation for the patient by a competent surgeon in a well-equipped hospital to maximize outcome and minimize risk is what allows you to choose the operation for the patient. It's a good PR for you. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I was able to cover the topic.